All right, well, it's finally here. Kick Joel Osteen Sunday. <laughs> I've told this story before, but I ordered this stupid book here on uh, Your Best Life Now, it's called. I ordered this thing on the Internet from a store in Pennsylvania, and it took a month for it to get here. Go figure. That's what you get when you get the choose the cheapest shipping, I guess. <laughs> but I do want to talk about Joel Osteen this morning. Um, he's a minister of Satan. He's not a Christian, and I'm going to demonstrate that today. A lot of people are going to be shocked by that. You know, Some of his followers might actually hear this sermon, but I want you to listen to it. I want you to consider what's being said here. Now, what's the title of the book? Your Best Life Now. Well, how many lives do you have? You say, well, cats have nine lives. I actually know they don't. But uh, how many lives do people have? No. Two. No. No. You have two. You have your mortal life and you have your immortal life. Let me show you that. First Timothy chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. We're going to look at that quick here. Now, if you're just coming along and hearing this for the first time, if you've stumbled across this message, we are Bible believers, so we look up things in the Bible. We read a lot of Scripture. We're going to be hitting a lot of Scripture this morning. All right, you're, you're not going to hear a lot of cute little stories from me like you hear from Joel Osteen. All right, we're going to look here, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is, and of that which is to come. You see two lives there. All right, verse 9. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. You know, a lot of people say, and, and the Bible does teach this, that if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you will have eternal life. And that's true. But there's a sense in which if you reject Jesus Christ, you also have eternal life. Your destination is different. Your destination is into the lake of fire, and you have eternal death, actually. You spend, yeah, the second death. You spend eternity dying. But you never really die. You never are, you know, what's the thing uh, they say, uh, not... Uh, I can't think of it right now. The thing where you go to hell and then you're you're just you burn up and you're gone. Oh, annihilation. Annihilation. Yeah, yeah. I couldn't think of the word. Jehovah's Witnesses. Yeah, thing. Jehovah's Witnesses say that you know. Well, they actually say it's the grave, but you know, whatever. They're doctrine of annihilation or something. Yeah, something. But the point is, you have two lives. Whether you're saved or lost, you have this life here. Right now, the life that you have, you are. You are not, you know, nobody in eternity is going to be listening to this message. You know, the Lord's going to be aware of it, but it's not like people up in heaven are going to turn into tune into sermon audio or you know anything like that. People that are listening to my voice right now, you are mortal. Okay, you are living your first life. Your second life is going to be in eternity. So, can you have your best life now? Well, let's look about that. Revelation chapter twenty-two. We're going to see who Joel Osteen is really addressing with his book. Revelation chapter 22, we're going to read a bunch of verses here. I'm going to read down through it quickly. I want you to read and, and understand this, this description of heaven here. Revelation 22, verse 9. And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal, and had a wall great and high and had twelve gates and at the gates twelve angels and names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. And on the east three gates, and on the north three gates, and on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and in them the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And he that talked with me... Oh, did I say chapter 22? Yeah. Oh. I have that written there. Okay, I'm sorry. Chapter 21. Okay, chapter 21, verse 15. And he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city and the gates thereof and the wall thereof. And the city lieth four square and the length is as large as the breadth. And he measured the city with the reed 
12,000 furlongs, the length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. And he measured the wall thereof in hundred and forty and four cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is, of the angel. And the building of the wall of it was of jasper, and the city was pure gold, like unto clear glass. And the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third a chalcedony, the fourth an emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the, the eighth beryl, the ninth a topaz, the tenth a chrysoprasus, the eleventh a jacinth, the twelfth an amethyst, and the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Every several gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, as it were transparent glass." Verse 22, And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it, and the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it, and there shall in no wise enter into it, Anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination, or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Now, I messed up there because it says Revelation 22 up here is the chapter heading. <laughs> you know. Again, not perfect. Now, let me ask you a question. Can you please show me anything on earth that looks like that? Can you please show me gold that's so pure that it's like transparent glass? Can you show it to me? No. So would it be fair to say a Christian can have a better life now than this? Hardly. <laughs> now let's look at another group. So a Christian, in other words, can't have their best life now, can they? No. Let's look at another group that would qualify for having their best life now. Turn back to Revelation chapter 20. This one I do have right. Revelation chapter 20, verse 11. It says here, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Let me just stop there for one second. Remember what we just read over there in Revelation chapter 21? Who was in that, that holy city? Those that are written in the Lamb's book of life. These people here are the ones that are not written in the Lamb's book of life. All right, we're dealing with lost people here. There will be no saved people at the great white throne judgment. This is the final judgment for the lost world. And if you look up there at verse 10, Satan, the devil, is actually cast into the lake of fire. So even this, even the devil at this point is judged. But let's continue here. Verse 13. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now let me ask you a question. Those people that make it into the lake of fire for all of eternity, is that their best life or was their best life now? If it was now. Yeah. Their best life is right here on the earth. Okay? In hell, there's no water. How many lost people have plenty of water right now? All of them. Yeah. So who's this book really written to? This is written to hell-bound sinners. Somebody whose best life is right now is somebody that ends up in hell for eternity. This is not written to Christians. But people are so warped in their thinking, so anemic in their understanding of Scripture, that they think that this is a Christian book. It's not a Christian book. This guy is a Satanist. A real one. If you read your Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 13-15 through 15, talks about the ministers of Satan. They appear as the ministers of righteousness. Now, if they were around in the first century, don't you think there's probably a few here today? You know, in the last times, right before the Antichrist shows up? Uh, yeah, I think so. Especially when Jesus Christ says, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name. You know? Yeah. 
Absolutely. We have a minister of Satan here. Now, I want to demonstrate it for you. I actually had to force myself to go through this thing. And uh, before I read some of the garbage in here, what page do you think he had a salvation message on? In the beginning or the, the end or in the middle maybe? No? Not in there. Wow. The whole book. You know, you have a quote-unquote Christian minister and he's trying to tell people, and this is marketed to saved and lost, by the way. This is marketed to, to the lost world as well as the saved, and yet he never tells people how to be saved. You know why that is? Because he himself is not saved. He's after their money. That's all this book is. Let me read you a couple of things. We have here the introduction. <clears throat> it's weird because I'm as, as I was reading this book, I'm like going through it and I can hear his voice as I'm reading it. <laughs> you know, this sissy voice. I'll read it like he does. Many people go through life with low self-esteem, focusing on the negative, feeling inferior or inadequate, always dwelling on some reason why they can't be happy. Others put off their happiness till some future date. <laughs> okay, I'm not going to do that anymore. But the point is, look what he says there. Others put off their happiness till some future date. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Things are never going to be right down here on the earth. You can have joy. There are times when you have happiness. Things will go, you know, well. The Lord will bless you with uh, new things or whatever, good times, you know, sure. But if you're really truly saved, you know that this isn't it. <laughs> Your best life isn't right now. It's in the future. It's what's coming. But if you're a hellbound sinner, I know there's a guy uh, on YouTube that I watch, and he does, you know, gun reviews and stuff like that. The guy's really good, you know, uh, with guns and stuff. He can hit targets. Very talented man. But he's lost. And you know what one of his favorite uh, sayings is? And this is a common saying among the lost. Life is good. Well, it is for a lot of lost people. A lot of lost people have very good lives down here. Their best life is right now. But let's look at the next page. Oh, I went too far. And he's talking about how that, you know, people are looking for things and happiness and stuff. And, and you know, someday I'll be rich. Someday I'll be happy. And someday, here's what he says. Unfortunately, someday never comes. Today is the only day we have. We can't do anything about the past, and we don't know what the future holds. But we can live at our full potential right now. Now, if you come to me and you say, Hey, hey Brian, uh, do you know what the future holds? <laughs> How much time do you have? You know, <laughs> Sit down. <laughs> We're going to be here for a while. I'll tell you what the future holds. You know, listen to the sermons here on Sermon Audio. We know what the future holds. You know, the members of Bible Believers Fellowship are not ignorant about what's coming. But he says here, in your best life now, we'll explore how to enlarge your vision, develop a healthy self-image, discover the power of your thoughts and words, let go of the past, find strength through adversity, <laughs> live to give and choose to be happy. Wow, I feel better already. And uh, let's we'll go here quick before we go to the next quotation from this stupid book. Go to Ephesians chapter 1. Should a Christian know what's coming? Yes. And we'll see it here. Ephesians chapter 1. And uh, I, I have another book here. I actually found this one locally. Become a Better You. <laughs> I haven't looked through this thing yet, but maybe I'll do a sermon on that in the future. We'll see. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 10 says here that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Now what's going on there? Well, the, the ones that are in heaven are those saints that have died and their souls are up there with the Lord. The ones that are on earth are in him. Notice it says that, even in him. Us Christians, the saved Christians, we are members of the body of Christ. This is a reference to the rapture. Look at verse 11. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Your destination is fixed if you're saved. Verse 12. That we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. You can't 
Take these promises if you first haven't trusted in Christ. Verse 13, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. I talked about that with the pre-trib uh, rapture judgment. That sermon, you can listen to that, about the thing of we are his purchased possession. And someday, right now, he has a sold sticker on us. you know. And someday he's going to come to redeem us. And that's the rapture, which is going to happen before the tribulation. But we'll continue here. Next, we're going to go to page 5 of your best life now. It says here, quote, But God wants us to constantly be increasing, to be rising to new heights. God wants to increase you financially. Oh, boy. By giving you promotions, fresh ideas, and creativity. The scripture says that God wants to pour out, quote, his far and beyond favor. Huh? You can't go around thinking negative, defeated, limiting thoughts. <laughs> I've had this sickness for years. I guess it's my lot in life, he writes. Okay. I've had this sickness for years. I guess it's my lot in life. Wasn't there somebody the one time that wrote that uh, I besought the Lord thrice that the thorn in the flesh might be taken away? Yeah. And God says, my greatest grace is sufficient for thee. Nevertheless, my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I glory in my infirmities. I, wonder, I don't remember who said that. You know, you can read over in, uh, I think it's 2 Corinthians, where Paul wrote that. <laughs> but what's he quoting here? He has a little footnote here. This thing of his far and beyond favor. What's he quoting? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 7. So let's go to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 7. It's right over here. We're going to start at verse 4 to get in context. Remember, a text without a, a context is a pretext. Verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Look at verse 7. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in kindness, in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. So what this liar did is he took a promise that's written about heaven, the life to come, not your life right now. And it's saying there, the life to come is going to be glorious and, and it's going to be a wonderful thing. But this liar took it and he said, that's for today. That's for right now. What a deceiver. Now we're going to go to page 13. Just incredible. Now, next we have, this is chapter 2, Raising Your Level of Expectancy. He says here, Program your mind for success. The Bible says, Set your mind and keep it set on the higher things. And by the way, what he's doing, what these false prophets will do, they'll use as many versions as they can. And he actually, there are times in here he'll say that the scripture says, and then he'll just go off and, and just explain what he thinks it should say. And you look at the, there's no footnote. Why? He's making his own Bible out of his own mind. He just, he just comes up with it. He does, he does that numerous times in this stupid book. But what verse is he quoting there? The Bible says, set your mind and keep it set on the higher things. Turn to Colossians chapter 3, verse 2. Colossians chapter 3, verse 2. You know the reason that God gave us written scripture is so that we could check people out. God doesn't want us walking around without the Bible in front of us. Let's start at verse 1. If, notice the little word there, qualifies it if ye then be risen with christ seek those things which are above where christ sitteth on the right hand of god set your affection on things above not on things on the earth hmm isn't that interesting but he makes it here program your mind for success and then he makes it about the earth but it's plainly talking about things in heaven see your best life isn't going to be right now as a christian but a liar like that will tell you that it is. Just incredible. Page 33. 
here in your, your best life now. <laughs> okay, he says here, Don't let anybody convince you that God wants you to barely get by in life. The Bible says, Enlarge the place of your tent. Let the curtains of your habitation be stretched out. Spare not. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes. For soon you will be bursting at the seams. What a powerful picture of God's desire for you. God is, get, God is saying, get ready for more. Make room for increase. Enlarge your tents. He's saying, expect more favor, more supernatural blessings. Don't become satisfied with where you are. Hmm, that's interesting. What verse is he trying to butcher this time? Well, this one's back in your Old Testament. Isaiah chapter 54. And these devil worshippers like Osteen, They'll go all through the Bible and just rip verses completely out of context and try to make them promises for you today. We're going to see who this promise is actually for. Isaiah chapter 54, verses 2 through 3. Okay, it says here, Enlarge the place of thy tent, and let them stretch forth the curtains of thine habitations. Spare not, lengthen thy cords, and strengthen thy stakes. For thou shalt break forth on the right hand and on the left, and thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles and make the desolate cities to be inhabited. <laughs> Who's it talking about? The nation of Israel in the Millennial Kingdom. I mean, you have, basically, you have, I mean, look around you. you got all these houses and all these riches and lands and everything. Over half of the people that inhabit all these riches, over half of them are going to be slaughtered in the time of Jacob's trouble coming the great tribulation time period there's going to be a lot of stuff left over to inherit a lot of riches a lot of lands and guess who's going to get it the jews oh that's racism absolutely <laughs> yep i'm real sorry for you right now god's no respecter of persons you you know you have black christians you have white christians you have hispanic you have oriental and you have jewish christians you know we're all members of the body of christ but we're going to go up there, we're going to be transformed into the image of Christ, and we're going to come back down, be ruling and reigning with Christ. But Israel is going to be the center, the kingdom, the center of the kingdom on earth, the kingdom of heaven. And the Jews that are left after that time period, the Jews that have endured to the end, they're going to inherit what the riches of the Gentiles. And any Gentile nations that are left are going to be in subjection to the Jews going to be something for these replacement theology people they're going to have a rough time of it and by the way if we're transformed into the image of christ that means you're going to be jewish <laughs> oh you know that's going to be so horrible for some of these you know white Aryans and the and the black supremacists and stuff too boy they're going to have a time of it should a Christian be satisfied with poverty? He says here, don't become satisfied with where you are. Well, let's look about that. First Tim, or, uh, excuse me, Philippians. We'll go there first. Philippians chapter 4. We're going to look at what the greatest Christian that ever lived had to say about that. Philippians chapter 4, verse 10. Now, I mean, if Joel Osteen's a great, fine Christian minister, then he should certainly pattern his ministry after Paul, shouldn't he? Philippians chapter 4, verse 10. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein ye were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Don't become satisfied with where you are. Hmm. Doesn't seem to line up with what Paul had to write, does it? First Timothy chapter 6. First Timothy chapter 6 verse 5. Some interesting scriptures here. Perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. Do I ever have any intention of going to see Joel Osteen and going into his church? Absolutely not. No intention at all. Let's continue here. Verse 6. 
But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. I wonder if uh, Smiley Joe here would be content if he was reduced to food and clothing. No. He'd probably be screaming and kicking and swearing and you know throwing stuff around like a little brat. And it's interesting, too, because he talked about his powerful daddy. That's what he called him. You know, my daddy. He was a powerful preacher. And he talked to me. He was bragging different times in here about how he got pulled over as a teenager. And he just threw his daddy's name out. And it was like, oh, 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 you know, we'll just let you go. Almost like he was a member of the Illuminati or something like that. Or the, some secret society that, you know, they were, the cops were like, whoa, you know, you're, you're John Osteen's boy, you know. Well, we'll leave you alone. That's what was going on. Whatever. <laughs> Rich kid. Verse 9. So let's, let's continue seeing here Paul's instruction to people that are rich. Verse 9. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. I wonder if Paul would be for a man buying a football stadium to put his church in. And it was interesting because there was somebody else that was trying to get it and they took him to court and fought so they get this football stadium. Couple year battle, court battle, fighting to get a sports stadium so he could put 16,000, his 16,000 member church into it. Big money making scheme. Just incredible. Now we'll go to page 48. <coughs> A new start. <laughs> this is a, another good one here. Israel's second ruler, King David, made a lot of mistakes. He committed adultery and even ordered a man to be murdered. But when he repented and sought forgiveness, God forgave him and gave him a new start. David's attitude was, I just can't get away from the good things of God. What? Isn't that nice? You say, well, uh, what about the matter of God killing his son? Yeah. What about that? Well, it's kind of interesting because he actually does mention it. Page 151, later on in this book, he actually gets into that a little bit. Page 151, quote, In the Bible we find an interesting account of when King David's baby was dreadfully sick near death. Despite David's passionate prayers on the seventh day, the child died. He was just sick, you know, and David prayed for him and he died anyhow. Why don't we actually see what the Bible says? Turn back in your Old Testament to 2 Samuel chapter 12. We're going to turn here because I want to show you something very important. 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 13. <clears throat> now, if you know the story of King David, he basically saw a woman and he wanted her and he had her husband killed so he could have her. And actually, he actually committed adultery with her before her husband was dead. Um, and she was with child because of that relationship. So David had to kill her husband as a result. Second uh, Samuel chapter 12, verse 13 and David said unto Nathan, here's when David was found out, I have sinned against the Lord, and Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin, thou shalt not die. In the Old Testament, if you committed adultery, you were stoned to death. So God did have mercy for David there. But let's continue, verse 14. How be it, you're not going to die, but how be it, because by this thy or be, by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. 
And Nathan departed unto his house, and the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bare unto David, and it was very sick. David therefore besought God for the child, and David fasted and went in and lay all night upon the earth. The baby just didn't get sick because he caught a flu bug or something like that. God struck him. And notice it's it, God could have just went boom, die, and pff, that would have been it. He didn't do it that way. He said, for seven days, you're going you're gonna to agonize, David, and your son's going to die slowly. Does God judge sin? Yeah. Don't think that you can sin and get away with it. Somebody like this will have you believe that. They'll say, oh, the, you know, the, uh, God, David sinned a little bit, but God forgave him. You know, he just went right back to being happy. And I know well, there was the time when his son got sick, but, you know, he still loved God. You know, God killed his son. Verse 18, And it came to pass on the seventh day that the child died. So you see, he died there. Now jump down to verse 20. Then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his apparel and came into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Then he came to his own house and when he required, they set bread before him and he did eat. Then said his servants unto him, What thing is this that thou hast done? Thou didst fast and weep for the child while it was alive, but when the child was dead, thou didst rise and eat bread. And he said, While the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, Who can tell whether God, <clears throat> whether God will be gracious to me and the child, that the child may live? But now he is dead, wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. Let me just interject a little teaching of Scripture here, a little bit of a Bible doctrine. Where did it say that the child accepted Jesus Christ or had sacrifices or did whatever was required for salvation? It doesn't. So what, are you, what do you learn here? This child was not accountable for its sins or the sins of, of his parents. So when he died, he went to be with the Lord. So if you lose a child that's under the age of, of what we would call accountability. In other words, they can not they can understand that you're upset with them, but they can't understand that they've sinned against God. If your child dies at that before they can be accountable, they're going to be with the Lord. And you better keep that in mind, I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. Your child's not coming back. You lost a child and you're lost, you're not saved. Your child's not going to ever come back to you. The only way you can ever see your child again is if you get saved then you'll spend eternity with your child. Just wanted to throw that in there. I don't think we actually have a specific sermon on that subject. But uh, <clears throat> So you see there what happened. Yes, God forgave David's sin, but it wasn't until after he punished him. And like I said, you can sin, and I mean, you think of the sin that he did. That was a very serious sin. And if you do that kind of thing, you pull that kind of thing off as a Christian, you're not going to get away with it. God's going to, you know, have to smack you around a little bit. Now we'll go to the next quote, page 58. It says here, uh, Consequently, we must learn to love ourselves, faults and all. Love your faults? Or perhaps you could say sins, you know? God loves you unconditionally. His love for you is based on what you are, not on what you do. Really? And by the way, the whole way through this thing, it's God, 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 God. The only time he uses Jesus' name is when he's talking about nice things that Jesus did in the Scriptures. Jesus is never spoken of as, you know, well, I, mean, he, I think he does say about you know Jesus as God like one or two times. But for the most part, it's just God, 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 God. And see, his main thesis is the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of men. Which is an occult doctrine. That's a Masonic doctrine. The fatherhood of God, the brotherhood of man. We're not all God's children. Okay? When you get saved, you become a child of God. Now are you the sons of God. You know, but you're not before that. And Jesus Christ, when he was here on the earth, he talked to the Pharisees and he said, Ye are of your father the devil. He didn't say, Oh, well, you're all God's children, you know, and hopefully you all get saved and God loves you unconditionally. 
you aren't going to find that teaching in Scripture. Alright? Romans chapter 7. We'll go there. Love yourselves, faults and all. God loves you unconditionally. His love for you is based on what you are, not on what you do. Let's see about that. Again, we'll listen to the finest Christian that's ever lived, the Apostle Paul. Let's see what he wrote. Romans chapter 7, verse 23. He says here, But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then with the mind I myself serve the, serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. If you are a Christian, a real true Bible-believing Christian, born again, washed in the blood, you understand that struggle. You understand you get up in the morning and all of a sudden these thoughts come into your mind and you go, get, get it. stop that. What are you doing? You know, you get around food or something like that and you eat too much or you eat the wrong thing. Why did I do that? You know, or you, I mean, it's just a constant war with the flesh. You don't say, oh, I love myself, my faults and all. <laughs> you don't do that. But again, a lost person would. A lost person would say, hey, I enjoy life. I have a good time in life. I, Oh, man, life is so good, you know. I mean, it, what was the thing in the beer commercials? You know, it don't get any better than this or something, you know, a guy standing there with his beer. Yeah. Think about what he said. It don't get any better than this. So what's he saying? It's his best life now. Well, I can tell you, if you're a Christian, it does get better than this. It will. <laughs> Someday in eternity. All right, well, let's go on to the next thing here. Page 68 and 69. Don't let other people, systems, or circumstances influence your estimation of your value. Don't let a system tell you that you don't have value. In other words, you shouldn't have a preacher preaching against your sin and have you feel bad about yourself. Perhaps you've even convinced yourself that the negative things that happened in your past are all your fault. That you deserve nothing but heartache, pain, guilt, and condemnation. Friend, nothing could be further from the truth. Oh, the sins of your past, they're not your fault. God loves you unconditionally. <laughs> you know, yeah. Okay, there are some things that, that can happen to you and happen in your life that aren't your fault. You know, things that other people do to you or whatever. Still, you have your reaction to that. But the fact of the matter is, when it gets right down to it, every man shall give account of himself before God. You aren't going to get up there to heaven and he'll say, okay, open the book of life. And you say, well, just hold on, Lord. There were a lot of people that wronged me down there. And the Lord will say, oh, I didn't realize that. Okay, come on into heaven because you were wronged by other people. You know, you had a bad childhood or something like that. <laughs> come on. But see, that's how lost people think. Next quotation here. He's talking to this guy named Steve that had a, a rough life. And that's all this book is, by the way. It's just story after story after story. And it's funny, too. I just want to say this before we continue. He's hitting every group. One minute he'll be talking about baseball. Then a little bit later he'll talk about basketball. Then he'll talk about how he likes to watch football occasionally. Then he'll say uh, about duck hunting in one place. And then he talked about this young woman that wanted to get married and this older woman that, that her kids didn't come. You know, What's he doing? He's appealing to every group. It's kind of like a used car salesman. You get around some of these really cheesy used car salesmen they'll try to find out about your personal likes and try to be your buddy you know so they can sell you a car what's going on here but continuing on read the next quotation here i told him steve you cannot allow your self-esteem and your sense of value to be determined by how other people treat you the bible tells us that god accepts us even if everybody else in the world rejects us God will never reject you, Steve. He always accepts you. Really? Is that so? Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. We're going to see about this thing of God always accepting you. No matter what you've done. 
And we're going to see some real vile sinners here. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 23. We're going to see a description of people that God sends to hell. You ready? Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Well, those are good people there. Prophesying in Jesus' name, casting out devils in Jesus' name, doing many wonderful works in Jesus' name. What's he say? I never knew you. And by the way, he talks about there that they're going to answer to the Father which is in heaven. Okay, doing the will of the Father which is in heaven. And he says there in verse 23, Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. What's that mean? It means that Jesus Christ is the Father. Very interesting. But you see, if old Smiley Joe met with people, I bet there are people in his church that do many wonderful works. Doesn't count. You have to come to God as a sinner that needs to be saved. All right. But we'll continue on here. Page 76. I was going to put this thing into two different messages, but I just want to get through this. I don't think I could do another week with this guy. Uh, page 76. He says here, Become what you believe. I am what I am today because of what I believed about myself yesterday. Isn't that nice? Why don't you give God the glory? Would a pastor who makes it up to a, a, the place of, of having 16,000 members and being able to buy a football stadium and all over national TV and everything, and he says, I am what I am today because of what I believed about myself. And he's a Christian? I don't think so. Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1 verse 20. Again, as Bible believers, we check the Scriptures, we search the Scriptures to see if these things are so, like the Bereans did. Philippians chapter 1, verse 20. It says here, According to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I wot not. For I am in strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. What an interesting attitude. Turn to First Peter chapter 4. <clears throat> First Peter chapter 4, verse 11. It says here, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. Now, what are the oracles of God? Well, you should be holding it in your hands right now. It's the King James Bible for English-speaking Christians. These are the oracles of God. So when a preacher speaks, he should be filling most of his speech with the Word of God. What he's saying should line up with this book. Continuing, if any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Verse 12, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye, if ye be reproached for the name of Christ, Happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. I Now, maybe we could go over those again, but I didn't see anywhere in there where it said that if you've gotten to a point of success as a preacher, you got there by yourself. I didn't, I didn't see that there. I saw a lot about Jesus Christ being glorified. I didn't see much about man being glorified. 
unless it's through Jesus Christ. See, we have somebody who's totally contrary to what the Bible teaches. Page 80. This is interesting. He says here, he's talking about how that you need to act on when God does things for you and whatever. He says, nearly 20 years after God spoke the promise, little Isaac was born to Abraham and Sarah. What he's saying is, between the time that Abraham went into Hagar and they had Ishmael, that it was nearly 20 years later. What's the Bible teach? We're not going to turn there for sake of time, but Genesis chapter 21, verse 5, And Abraham was in hundred years old when his son Isaac was born unto him. Abraham was 100 when Isaac was born. Genesis 16, 16 says, And Abram was fourscore and six years old when Hagar bare Ishmael to Abram. What is 86 from 100? 14. Is 14 nearly 20? <laughs> No. God doesn't even know his Bible. Nearly 20 years later. What nearly 20? 14 years difference between the two. Again, you know, you got to check these guys. Page 105. The Bible says, set your mind on the things which are above. What are the things that are above? The higher things. Quite simply, they are the positive things of God. Huh? Okay, and then he goes on, God is positive, there is nothing negative about him. <laughs> really? <laughs> is that so? Nothing negative about God. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity, I never knew you. Oh, that's positive, yay! <laughs> okay. We're not dealing with a Christian here. Continuing on, page 192. It says here, he writes, When it's my time to go, I want to spend my last day here on this earth full of joy, full of faith, and full of victory. I've made up my mind that I'm going to live my best life now, and when my days are done, I'm going to die standing up on the inside. Huh? Okay. You know, you read the dying words of D.L. Moody. You know, he's dying and his family's there around him, and he's like, He's like, I can see heaven, you know. Heaven opens before me. I can, I can see, you know, he lost two granddaughters that were really little. And he's like, I can see, the, you know, my granddaughters. And, you know, he was all, you know, happy. He could see heaven. He didn't say, I'm dying standing up on inside. <laughs> Come on. What we have here is somebody who has no hope of eternity. He has no idea. I don't know what the future holds. Well, that's fairly obvious. Page 255. Just about done here with these quotations. I'm sorry to subject you to this this morning. <laughs> and here we go. What's the purpose of your best life now? What's the purpose of this book? Okay. What do we read in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10? The love of money is the root of all evil. Whenever you get one of these con artists, they will build you up, they'll butter you up, and get your money from you. That's the purpose of these guys. That's what. That's the direction that they go. So here you have all that book up to that point right there, all telling you nice little stories and getting you warmed up. Now we have here, page 255. If you normally give 10% of your income, stretch your faith a bit and give 11%. <laughs> I love this part. If you give with a shovel, it's going to be given back with a shovel. <laughs> <laughs> Amen to that. We've been getting plenty of it here. <laughs> you know. Uh, and I know it is imperative that the people with the greatest need continue to sell. <laughs> you got to get that money in, you know. I have a little statement that I made one time. If you sow the seed, they'll provide the dung. Okay. <laughs> Figure that out. Second Corinthians chapter 8. We talked about this. I actually had a question on this issue of tithing. And uh, Brother Jesse there did a really good sermon on the issue of tithing, showing that this forced, you got to tithe 10% thing. Uh, there's a lot of problems with that. We're going to see what the purpose of tithing or giving to the Lord's work is here. Second Corinthians chapter 8, verse 12. 
For if there be first a willing mind, it is accepted according to that a man hath, and not according to that he hath not. What did Smiley Joe say? He said, I know it is imperative that the people with the greatest need continue to sow. You mean the people that hath not? Oh, yeah, you got to continue. Continuing on here. Verse 13. For I mean not that other men be eased and ye burdened, but by an equality, that now at this time your abundance may be a supply for their want, that their abundance also may be a supply for your want, that there may be equality. As it is written, he that had gathered much had nothing over, and he that had gathered little had no lack. Do you think that there's equality in Smiley Joe's church? When he's buying a football stadium? Do you think, I wonder how many little small churches in his area, I wonder how many he put out of business. (laughs) And I do mean out of business. You know, I wonder how many had to close their doors because he took their members. I wonder how what the equality is like in his congregation. It's disgusting to me to see these multi-millionaire preachers taking money from people that don't have it to give. And even if they have it to give, why is it going to this guy? You know? See, he's not following the scriptural principle there of tithing, of giving to the Lord, to the work of the Lord. He's not doing it. You know? Let's just, I mean, just assume for a second that he's legitimate. you got a company like Local Church Bible Publishers that has six employees printing some of the finest Bibles in North America. Amen. Six employees, and this knucklehead here has a football stadium mm-hmm. with how many people in it. You mean to tell me that's equality? No, it isn't. Now we'll go to jump over one chapter to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. We're just about done here. A couple more places. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6. Okay, it says here, But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly, here you go, or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. He just told you there that you have to give, and he goes on to try and quote this, but he doesn't. For some reason, he says here, the Bible clearly says, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully, period. Why not quote the next verse? Not grudgingly, not or of necessity. Why didn't he quote it? Because it would have debunked everything and he's trying to get through. That's why. Just incredible. Page 256. Understand, sowing seed is not a replacement for tithing. In fact, it is usually when you give over and above the first 10% of your income that this principle kicks into high gear. Isn't that nice? It belongs to God and should be given to your local church. So 10% of your income off the top, before taxes, before all you know all that stuff, you have to give that 10%. It belongs to your local church. Corporation. Yeah, corporation. Chapter and verse? I didn't seem to find any there. Uh-huh. He says over here on the next page, page 257, The scripture is not ambiguous about this matter. It says, In everything you do, put God first, and he will direct you and crown your efforts with success. Oh yeah? Where's the Bible say that? Turn back to Proverbs chapter 3. You see, these devils have created all these new versions to give you readings. The NIV a lot of times will replace righteousness with prosperity. Why? Well, because that's what they're about. They're about prosperity. And so they rewrite God's Word so so that it lines up with their perverted doctrines. And we're going to see that here. He says here again, I'll read it one more time. In everything you do, put God first and He will direct you and crown your efforts with success. Now what's he quoting? You go back to the footnote. It takes you to Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. 
Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy, way, in all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Where's the word success? Does directing thy path mean success? Well, it can. Maybe sometimes. But a lot of times, no. Do you think God wants you to be really successful in some big businessman or something? Hey, if you're successful in life, that takes a lot of time. It takes a whole lot of time. You know? I wonder how much time he spends keeping things running with his big, huge corporation, his big football stadium, bringing that money in. Oh, that's of the Lord. No, it isn't. No, it's not. One more place to read here in this ridiculous book. This is the last page, last part of it. Hold on to that new enlarged vision of victory that God has given you. Start expecting things to change in your favor. Dare to boldly declare that you are standing strong against the forces of darkness. <laughs> yeah. You will not settle for a life of mediocrity. Okay? <laughs> it's our faith that activates the power of God. The whole word of faith movement there, you speak it and then God has to, you know, accept it and God has to bow to your wishes is what this guy's teaching. Raise your level of expectancy. It's our faith that activates the power of God. Let's quit limiting him with our small-minded thinking and start believing him for bigger and better things. Remember, if you obey God and are willing to trust him, you will have the best this life has to offer and more. Make a decision this that from this day forward you are going to be excited about the life God has for you, if you will. Then he goes over the different chapters again. God will take you places in, you've never dreamed of, and you will be living your best life now. Yeah, God will take you places that you've never dreamed of. Not in your worst nightmares could you imagine what hell's going to be like. And these people that read this garbage, and there's no plan of salvation in here. He never leads people to Jesus Christ. So is God going to take these people that read this, is He going to take them to new places they never dreamed of? Yeah. Their best life will be right now. And their worst life is what's going to come in eternity. And it's something that they've never dreamed of. It's going to be so horrible. Why? Well, because they pursued success. They pursued the things of this world. You know, the Bible says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. This is completely contrary to Scripture. And yet, you go into the average Christian, you know, Christian, quote-unquote, bookstore, this is popular. The multi-million dollar seller. Millions and millions of copies sold. See? This is what's going to land people in hell right here. And he's smiling as he's taking your money and taking your soul to hell with him. Just disgusting. We're going to read one more place in the Scripture and then we're going to be done. You want to see the marks of a true Christian, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. I've been over these verses before, but I want to hit them one more time. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, starting at verse 4. Now, Paul here is addressing ministers of God, but the, the fact is, is, if you're a Christian, you have the ministry of reconciliation. Now, a woman can't be a pastor, but a woman can witness. A woman can, you know, be an ambassador of Jesus Christ, and you should be an ambassador of Jesus Christ. You say, oh, that sounds good. I want to be that. Okay, here's what to expect. Here's the approving. Verse 4, But in all things approving ourselves as the ministers of God, in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, in fastings, by pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness, on the right hand and on the left. You're going to be attacked from every angle. <laughs> by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true. People are going to think of you as a deceiver, but you're not. You're telling the truth. As unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as chastened and not killed, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, 
and yet possessing all things. I wonder why Smiley Joe didn't quote those verses and a whole lot of other verses that line up with that. Why? Because he's lost. His life that he has right now truly is his best life. This is as good as it's going to get for that guy. He talks in another place about how he has his dad's, you know, my daddy's uh, Lexus that was his, you know, and how he got upset because his wife scratched it the one time when she went to the car wash. And, you know, I, I, we have a big TV, big screen TV in our bedroom and, and lazy boy recliners and stuff. And, and you know, the we he talked about the one story how that right after they got married, they saw this huge big house being built and they were like, Oh, we got to believe that we'll have it one day. We got to believe. We got to have faith. We'll have our huge big mansion. And God answered our prayers. It's all money and success and building and, and money, 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 money. Why? Because he's going to hell. And so he has to do everything he can to be successful in this life. That's the whole issue. But if you're a Christian, your desire should be to have Jesus. You know, there's a an old uh, Afro or well, black spiritual song. Uh, it's they say about uh, give me Jesus, and they say you can have all this world. Give me Jesus. You know, and there's another song we actually sang it this morning. A hymn: I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be His than have riches untold. You know, and it goes through it. You know, the the song there. And I'm actually going to play a rendition of this. It's by the Rochesters. They have they're a, a Christian group. They sing bluegrass, but this is a really reverent rendition of the song, so I'm going to play that at the end of the sermon so you can hear it out there if you're not familiar with the song. You know, I know a lot of Christians I say about you need to listen to old hymns, and they're like, what's an old hymn? <laughs> you know, younger Christians. They've, they weren't raised with them. They're raised in these modern churches that don't sing the old hymns. So, you know, I want to try and interject some of that when I can. So I'm going to play that song here at the end of the sermon. But uh, if for some reason somebody's listening to this sermon and they and they are saying, you know, well, you know, I've been pursuing my best life now. I've been pursuing riches and prosperity. Can you really say that you're being persecuted? Can you really say that people look down on you and make fun of you and talk behind your back? Can you go through there in Second Corinthians chapter six verses four through ten? Can you relate to that? Well, if you can't, you're probably not saved. Not probably, you aren't saved. If you're a follower of Joel Osteen and you follow his teachings, you're not saved. I'll tell you that. Unless you're like extremely, extremely green, <laughs> you know, and just don't know any better. You need to get out of that place. Joel Osteen will lead people to hell. All right. Don't fall for these lying hypocrites like that guy. Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. So I guess we'll close here with a word of prayer and then I'll play the song. All right. Dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you for your word. How lost we would be without it. How easily we would be conned. You know, we have the people back there in the dark ages, they were just tricked and fooled by the Catholic priests because they had no scripture. They had nowhere that they could go and say, Well, thus saith the Lord. We have that, Lord, and I pray that we would never take your word, your King James Bible, we would never take it for granted, but that we would study it more and more. Lord, you know that the false prophets are just coming out of the woodwork. It's just incredible the amount of heresies that are out there today. And the only protection that the body of Christ has is your word. And to stay in your word and to know your word. And I pray, Lord, if there's some somebody out there that has listened to this message and they're not sure of their salvation, that they would get in contact with us and that they would get everything sorted out and that they would be able to know that their best life isn't going to be now. That they would see the truth and they would realize that their best life, their best hope is eternity. So I just uh, thank you, Lord, for giving us the opportunity to preach your word here at Bible Believers Fellowship and for the opportunity to get it out to all these people. And I just pray for your protection for the future and uh, for the protection of all those that listen to these sermons and that, that want to read your word and understand. And so I just ask all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I'd rather have Jesus than see. 
rather be his than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or lands. I'd rather be led by his name. This world.